Okay, so th this lecture is a little different than uh, the other ones insofar as we're going to look at a whole series of assays, or I assign assays. I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, I'm going to assume that you've read them. I'm going to try and make an argument based on the substance of the assays that I assigned. Those assays were, if I can get rid of this stupid thing here, uh, from loosely speaking from this work, The Weight of Glory. That's the main text. And that is, um, there are a series of sermons that Lewis delivered during wartime, roughly speaking. Uh, one's called Learning in Wartime. I didn't assign that, but they're all worth reading, actually. You know, why I'm not a pacifist. Is Theology Poetry is brilliant? The Inner Ring, brilliant. The Inner Ring, uh, I would suggest that, I don't think I required that here. I didn't even put it down, no. But the inner ring, if you want to understand the personal dynamics of what is going on in that hideous strength, uh, Lewis addresses a, I think, an implication of the theology of love, uh, which is a sense of inclusion and acceptance. And uh, he talks about the psychology of and the sort of pressure that comes from being a, a social animal like a human being is and wanting to be accepted and not excluded. That's that feeling of being an insider, not an outsider. And he talks about the enormous pressure that comes uh, often on people that co doesn't come through the form of argumentation or rational persuasion, but simply of being shut out or ostracized. And he sees that as a strong motivation, but really that is a, a desire to be loved. I mean, he picks up on that in the uh, work, The Four Loves as well. But the inner ring really talks about this desire to be, um, as I say, on an insider. And I, I've observed it myself over the years, um, as has everybody when you read the essay saying, oh yeah, I understand that. And everybody has experienced the desire to be in the group, and not to be outside of it. You want to be uh, accepted in some way, right? So it's a strong motivation, and uh, and it can be used for. Um, there's a, a a legitimacy to the desire, which is the product of our nature, I think, which is that we're made in the image of God, and uh, it's not good for us to be alone, as it says in Genesis, and that we want to be in that. A loving relationship in which our, our being is acknowledged, etc. And he's going to portray that in uh, that hideous strength in the form of an of a alternate society. It's a small little church group. Uh, Belbury of St. Anne's. It's a very uh, insignificant group there, but they are people that have a, uh, a sort of an, uh, a membership. I'll, I'll talk more about membership in a minute. But they, they satisfy that deep desire for uh, community and belonging, uh, which needs to be satisfied. It's not something that can be uh, set aside or ignored. And, uh, and he juxtaposes that with what goes on in the research university that uh, uh, operates under the, uh, under the uh, acronym NICE the National Institute of Coordinated Experiments. It's nice. <laughs> um, and, and there they, un they uh, undertake human experimentation and they have certain uh, viewpoints which he is going to associate with the to modern Tower of Babel. That's what that hideous strength is a reference to. It's the Tower of Babel. So he's going to so scientism and the sort of elitism that goes with that. So an appeal to the scientists as, as leaders uh, who will, um, who will um, guide the herd, as it were, into the next phase of evolution. And uh, the desire for people who are able to be in that inner ring of scientists who are on board with the plans and so forth. And he's going to depict a whole variety of, of characters that are in their uh, mixed cast of people. Everyone from a social scientist uh, to a uh, biologist to a a theologian to a businessman uh, to a woman who basically is a sadist but acts like a policewoman. Uh, there's a whole range of characters uh, motivated by different things, but uh, the uh, protagonist, Mark Studdick, wants in. He wants to be on the inner ring. He wants to feel valued 
and he wants to ha have his uh, gifts utilized. And so this appeal of being brought in is what motivates him and pulls him away from his wife, who's, who, is, uh, who is actually the person that the group wants. They want her and they're gonna get her through him, uh, which is rather interesting. But that's the inner ring, which I didn't even assign. Uh, but it's closely allied with the sense of membership. Membership is the positive way of expressing this and relates to something that uh, is revealed in scripture, the idea of being members of one body. So Lewis is aware, and I, I talked to this about this in the first class, um, about the implications of a view of human nature bequeathed to us by uh, Descartes the idea of the cogito, the, uh, the thinking substance uh, who, whose basis of certainty is the fact that he's thinking. The fact that he's doubting means that, that he's thinking, and if he thinks, then he exists. So thinking becomes the basis of his knowledge of himself. But it has no way of attaching that thinking self or thinking substance to the external world. There's no bodily existence to it. So again, other, many people have described it in terms of what sort of human nature results from Descartes' postulate, and it's been described as a ghost in a machine. The body's like a machine. And the science of the 18th century is very mechanistic. Its view of nature is mechanistic, uh, it's materialistic, um, and uh, it doesn't really know what to do with the human body. And it doesn't know what to do with human community for that matter. And to some degree, it regards the basic human form uh, under their really the watchword of the Enlightenment or the motivation, which is autonomy. And uh, I'm a little bit far, and I will pull the whole show down if I move over to the whiteboard here. But auto autonomy is com composed of two words, auto, which means yourself or just self. It's automobile is a self-propelling uh, thing. Uh, and nomos, the law, the law of yourself. Let everyone be a law unto themselves. And that's the sort of core commitment of the Enlightenment, is this idea for autonomy such that Immanuel Kant in his uh, little treatise that many people don't read, uh, he, he, what is the Enlightenment, was ist Aufklärung? Um, he describes uh, it as the emancipation from the tutelage uh, of the past and marked by the, uh, the dictum, sapere aude, dare to know. So you're not going to be constrained by your culture, by your family, by your religion, by anyone outside of yourself. You're going to dare, you're going to start from ground zero. It's, it's really Descartes, I think, being expressed through uh, philosophy and done in the name of audacity. And if you want to see a good portrait of that, in a, in a film version, look at Robin Williams in the Dead Poet Society. He represents that mindset of autonomy and, and rebelling against authority. If you've ever seen uh, Dead Poet Society, I recommend it. It's a good movie. Um, and he uh, gets the kids to rip pages out of their uh, textbooks and stand up si on top of the desks and, um, and basically rebel against authority. And it's done to the uh, music of, uh, of the French Revolution, basically. And uh, the, the, me the message there is, is uh, I wouldn't say it's subtle, um, but it, it's, uh, it's learned. You're not necessarily going to recognize that this is the appeal. So it's appeal to the tenets of Romanticism, which posits that every individual has the right of self-determination. That becomes the uh, motive of the, of the uh, League of Nations in, in, uh, at the end of the First World War. That every country has the right to self-determination, they can declare nationhood, and the other countries will allow them to do this. So it's an appeal to your own nature and particularly to the motivation of autonomy. Most people are warm and friendly towards that because it means I get to be myself and nobody can tell me what to do. Who, do, who, do, who wants somebody else to tell them what to do? Not, not many people. Uh, but the consequences of that 
are, are, that, are, are that it's chaos. And there's no way of organizing or ordering uh, the autonomous units within that nation uh, or even within that family. There's no, there's no hierarchy, there's no authority, there's no authority outside yourself. Right? And so the effect of that then to organize the chaos, because Aristotle says that the worst form of government is no government, anarchy, which is why every society that devolves into anarchy immediately calls for a strong man, ruler, to come and crack down to keep the chaos in check. That's why it's the worst, because it, 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 if you're going to get knifed on the streets, you would rather lose your civil liberties than, than deal with the threat of an imminent loss of life. So you'd be willing to, to let a tyrant be a tyrant rather than endure that daily threat of death. And again, that happened under COVID to some degree, not that they're comparable, but that was the appeal. It's an appeal to fear, right? If, if, the, if the threat is sufficient, we, rather than face the anarchy of the possibility of having you know, a virus make us sick and die, we would rather be locked down and be taken care of. And so we'll allow that to happen. So that's just the, it's just an age old human motivation there. Um, but the other consequence of it is not only that that appeal to autonomy ends up leading to nationalism and totalitarian governments. So the uh, fascism of uh, Hitler's Nazi Germany and the communism of Soviet Russia are the products of romanticism in the nation state. Um, it also leads to the, devil, to the uh, d dissolution of the natural ordering principles everywhere. So it dissolves the family unit as a unit of legitimacy and government and authority. So parents are no longer held to have responsibility for their children's well-being. The state will take care of that. Thank you very much, because these are autonomous units that deserve the right to express themselves and we're going to make sure in the name of uh, respecting their equality as human beings that they are not oppressed by their parents so we're going to ignore their legitimacy uh, it will do the same thing in the church see that as an oppressive institution and it will it will question that and again the government's going to come in to observe to make sure that equality is observed and that there's no exertion of authority outside of its own uh, and uh, Lewis sees this playing out all over the place and 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 it's playing out to this day I think most of you smirk because you thought I was talking about current affairs which I actually was not but it immediately comes to your mind because it obviously does still apply so this is the fruit of the enlightenment and the romantic period really and Lewis is talking about that so membership is a different notion of human nature that uh, rejects the notion of autonomy. We are members of one body. He's talking about Christian community now. And he's appealing to the Apostle Paul's idea that we are, I mean, there are various formulations, but one of them is members of a body. And how can a body operate without a stomach, without a head, without a mouth, without feet, without hands, and so forth? Well, it can, but it doesn't function quite so well. In fact, it's maimed. If certain parts are not there, um, it doesn't function at all. It just simply dies. But that's the appeal that he makes to, and he talks about human relationships in terms of membership, which are, as I say, they're utterly categorically opposed to the Enlightenment's core commitment to autonomy. And that comes with being uh, part of a Christian community is having a spiritual membership and belonging and connectedness to other human beings through the headship of Jesus Christ. That's really the, 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 uh, what Lewis is dealing about in, in memberships. And so he says, no Christian, indeed no historian, would accept the epigram which defines religion as what a man does with his solitude. Making religion a private matter, which is what you will hear to these days. You know, the religion, just like uh, the family, this is what I do in my private realm. Uh, let me talk a little bit about that. The, the, the term private sphere and public sphere are there from the ancient world. Uh, the ancient world placed a high value on the private sphere such that the state did not interfere with it at all. And for good or for ill, the 
pater familius, the head of the house, the father, had the right to do anything he wanted with those in his house, including execute them. And the state said nothing about it. Uh, his own natural born children became his children under the eyes of the law when he adopted them in a ceremony. You could adopt your own children or you could choose not to. So you better be not upsetting daddy too much, right? Because you're not, you may be my natural born son, but until I adopt you, you're not my heir. You have to be adopted. And so there's a lot of politics going on internally. And again, the state stays out of this. It, re it recognizes that the family has a, a, a legitimacy. Now that sense of legitimacy of the family erodes during the enlightenment. in part because of the belief that uh, progress will emancipate us from all forms of order. And so there's a devolution of authority that goes down to the lowest form. Uh, Lewis's comment, he says, it was one of the Wesleys, I think, who said that the New Testament knows nothing of solitary religion. We are forbidden to neglect the assembly uh, of ourselves together. This was my primary objection to the lockdowns under COVID. This is, we were forbidden to neglect the assembly of ourselves together. Christianity is already institutional in the earliest of its documents. The church is the bride of Christ. We are members of one another. So, and what he says that here, this is very interesting, is that the idea of a privatized religion where the state will leave you alone uh, depends on the state's definition of when you are alone and it will ensure that you are never alone. What's his, what's his phrase there? Uh, I can't remember. But it's the idea of um, that the public will, uh, so what you do on your own will remain your own business and will stay out of that business. Uh, Lewis said that this is a, an absolute myth that never happens. The state will ensure that you are never alone if that's the case and modern technology, surveillance and so forth is probably a proof positive in a way that he would never have imagined. It's more like George Orwell's 1984 where you have a screen all around you which is surveilling you at all times. I see that as the consequence again of a, uh, a lust for power on behalf of the elites and a desire to, on some people's part, a genuine desire to make to undo the, the, the wrongs that are done uh, by people towards other people. But it, it has a very high, power, high view of the, the, uh, the goodness of the state to intervene. It'll appeal to Romans 13, one to seven, for instance, and it will ignore the restrictions that are inherent in that. You know, it's there to wield the sword against injustice and so forth, it's not there to involve itself in family affairs or to rule over the church. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll leave that aside. Uh, that's the uh, essay on membership, but I, I just want to say it is what he presents there is a counterweight to the dominant weight of the culture which is towards autonomy and the state coming in to um, try and mel ameliorate the, the consequences of that. because. If the father and mother have no legitimacy in saying, this is my child, it's my mandate as a parent to overlook my child's education, and the state says, well, yes and no, we wanna make sure no abuse is happening. That sounds good because I don't want abuse to happen, but at that point, the state becomes a co-parent. And, and it's not an equal relationship. We're gonna come in whenever we see fit to do so. And it will do under the auspices of equality or justice, but over, overlook the fact that there is a, uh, an inherent sphere sovereignty that goes with the family and the church and the workplace and the school for that matter. I think I, I agree with the Dutch neo-Calvinists on this. I think there are such things as spheres of sovereignty which need to be recognized. It's a counterweight to that. And that's sort of what Lewis is presenting here. Now, he will present this sort of spiritual sense of membership throughout the sci-fi trilogy. I'm just saying it now. That's why I wanted to put it here on the course. Uh, on In Out of the Silent Planet, uh, Ransom, the hero, will meet aliens there who will quickly identify themselves as, as HNAU, H-N-A-U. 
And what is meant by now, I'm going to get to that in a bit, but it's basically a rational being, rational sentient being committed to uh, what Lewis and others will call the natural law or the law of human nature. But obviously it's inappropriate in that case because we're not dealing with humans, but a rational being who acknowledges uh, God's rule and reign over all things. Um, and he sees that as a, uh, a principle that goes beyond planet Earth and into the solar system. Now, he says that because the dominant weight of his culture is against natural law. Because autonomy opposes natural law. It sees no law outside of the self and the self, what is the nature of the self? Well, it has no physical human nature at all. It's just a rational co cognition process. And which is why contemporary post-humanism will give um, human rights to computers and AI. Right now, there's legislation lending uh, human rights to corporations and computers um, because it has no way, that's the way it will identify the forms of the rights there. Uh, but the effect of that is to suggest that human nature is no different than a machine. I'll say more about that in a second here. Um, why don't I say something about it right now? Uh, this was the issue at stake. Have I mentioned already? Uh, I know I did in the, the course on C.S. Lewis, but uh, B.F. Skinner's Beyond Freedom and Dignity. I did, right? And the behaviorism there. Um, they want to, and this is characteristic across the board, it's there in Freud when he sees uh, the future as an illusion. It's there in Skinner. It's there in Peter Singer. Uh, the bioethicist from Princeton, they all want to see uh, through uh, human nature for the principle behind it and overlook human nature and overlook in particular the importance of embodied human nature, which is, which is why we can have different concepts of gender and sexuality because actually these are a figment. They're something we create. They're not intrinsic to our nature. They're not part of our bodies. It's not in the beginning God created the male and female. It's from my autonomous perspective, I can determine, self-determine who or what I am. And I will identify myself and require you and get legal sanction and backing for me to um, have that recognized by others. Now that's coming up in recent days. Any comments or questions? Is that a question? No, it's not. Okay. Yes, sir. No, you, you do. Yes. So The, and, and the thinking substance, which is yourself, which is your nature. And there's, remember, Descartes has no physical way of connecting that thinking self. Now, he calls uh, the body the race extensa. The, the race cogitans is what he calls it, uh, the thinking uh, substance. A race is just a thing in Latin. And it's a thinking thing. And the race extensa is the extension of that thinking thing, which is the body. But it, it, note that it's, he effectively has a, a disembodied sense of self. And the body's not a part of it. It doesn't even have, have members. It doesn't even have parts. It's just what you think. And so w the way you think about yourself can become your identity, your nature. Because it boils down to that pretty much. Now, I think given that fact, the whole thrust of both Lewis and Tolkien's fiction is to suggest a nature that is connected uh, to physical bodies, but also to uh, natural law and uh, the sense that of what Lewis calls uh, now or a rational being. And that is associated with personhood. So when we think about the, the persons of God, we t I, I, the uh, term that is used of, of human nature in Genesis 1, uh, 26 is we're made in the image of God, right? So God, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Right, male and female, the two together. Bear the image of God and also separately, they bear the image of God. 
So then it begs the question, what, is that, what does that exactly mean? And it's not fully fleshed out there in the text. But it's clear that there's something of our identity and his identity. In God's identity, we see our identity. But also there's something about the specificity of male and female there which reflects his nature. Something of that. So, and in a sense, there's an incompleteness. It's not that, right, for the first account of, so Genesis 2 pulls it back uh, and talks about Adam being created before Eve. And he's incomplete. And God even says for the first time, it's not good. Right? In the Genesis 1, it's, it's good. It, he saw it was good. It was good. It was good. In Genesis 2, for the first time, it is not good that man be alone. And it's not a defect of uh, the fall. It's not evil. It's just not good that man should be alone. And so he wants a helper. Parades all sorts of animals out front. No, 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 no. At last, he puts Adam in a deep sleep and pulls Eve out of his side, the rib, and he says, aha, finally, at last, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This, this, she's the one, right? And there's a sense that he is, to use the gushy Tom Cruise, you know, you complete me? Yeah, there's a sense of that, right? There's a sense of there's something in me that is lacking that you pull together. Yes? And not you, of course. And not me, of course. I stopped watching. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but it's called Altered Carbon. Where oh, I've heard of that. And I meant it's on my to-do list to watch. Okay, it's not the most horrible thing. Like, I'm sure you can watch it, but, but, but I'm not going to promote it. Because it's, it's transhumanism, right? And cyborg identity and so forth? Yes. Without ruining the plot. The idea that you can transfer your consciousness, transfer your being from one body to another. And the body, the disembodied self, is very prevalent. Is very prevalent. What I guess I'm wondering is, do they have a perspective where there is an end? Is there an end? Or is, do they see the fact that there is no end as good? So the rational process of this and the rational end of it, is there one, is the question. Like, what's the end goal of this? Well, Lewis explores that in his sci-fi. and doesn't really come to a conclusive answer and that's because it's never provided and the what he does note which i have also noted the effect of it is simply to degrade and demolish what is there and regard progress as emancipation from what's there devil comes to kill and maim and destroy he makes it even more i said the devil he actually sees it as a demonic agenda that's how he portrays it in uh, his sci-fi trilogy it is actually a demonic agenda to emancipate ourselves from the from the creaturely existence that God has given us as if it were not good as if we our own bodies and our own human nature were not good and of course it's fallen of course it's subject to sin but still there's a goodness to it otherwise it couldn't be redeemed God himself wouldn't take on a human body and he and his obedience his good actions could not be credited to us by imputed righteousness if uh, there was not something of humanity which could be, could redeem us and which was good. So the doctrine of original sin must never present us in terms that we are so awful that we're no longer human at all. That's one of the questions of what the effect of the fall is and what we mean by original sin. It doesn't mean uh, that the, Im the imago dei is effaced from us. It's gone. There's nothing there. It's that it's defaced. It's like graffiti on it, right? Or it's whatever. It's, it, so there's, it's still visible. There's still something there. There's still something of goodness in people. There's still something of, that uh, is lovable. But it's defaced by their actions, by their attitudes, by their hearts, such that it's not, we've lost original righteousness is what's been lost. Intrinsic righteousness, which came from being made in the image of God, has been lost. And, and it's lost all over the place. But it's not that we're wholly bad. That's not what original sin means. It just means that we've lost the original righteousness in, in all aspects of our life. A little bit, it's like holes, punctured, so it's not as it ought to have been. Um, and the, the attempt to rectify the injustices which people genuinely commit by doing the operation on human nature 
is simply to destroy the human nature, the human physical nature. That's the effect of it. Whether it's through gender uh, or sexual mutilation or through um, the scientific socialism of communist China or the eugenics movement of Nazi Germany, in which you're going to cull the herd from what the Slavs, the Jews, the uh, handicapped, whatever, like the inferior races to promote ge uh, genetic purity. It's the same agenda of trying to get rid of what is regarded as bad in order to promote the future. So I, I, I see its primary feature is that it's just destructive. And even the AI and transhumanist thing, which is, by the way, a hugely advanced project in Western research universities all over. <laughs> you would, if you don't know, you would not believe it, how far advanced it is. Uh, and exactly what you posited, putting a consciousness into a cyborg body, that exists, uh, that dream has existed for uh, centuries, but it's been speculated on as a realizable goal in the last 30 years. It's called posthumanism. I lecture on it in my lit theory class. Uh, it's tied into the environmental movement. Because there the nature of the green stuff and the water and the air is held to have a nature and we have a nature and what's the difference between our nature as human beings and the nature of the squirrel and the frog and the water and the green of the trees. What's the difference? They all have a nature, why should we privilege humans and human life over the rest of the natural order. We, we, gotta, we gotta flatten that out in the name of equality. We push down rather than raise up is the effect of that. So we give animal rights. The animal rights movement talks about animals as persons and even tries to give human rights to animals as a way of safeguarding them, which I believe is a good thing, by the way, as, as treating creatures uh, with compassion and not allowing barbarous practices to be, uh, you know, exercised on poor little animals. Um, but giving them human rights doesn't actually help them, it just hurts us. It, it ignores that there's something about human nature which bears the image of God, which is not there. Anyway. But last semester, I talked about this as a, as a, there's a whole trajectory here. And I, I just want to repeat something I said last semester for those of you who weren't there. There's a shift from a religious point of view to a naturalistic one. We, we move the idea of the idea of autonomy and self-expression is not in scripture except in one place. When Moses asks God who he is, you know, identify yourself. Because Adam and Eve don't identify themselves, right? They're named. This is Adam, this is Eve. Actually, Adam calls Eve Eve, the mother of all living. He right? gives her her name, uh, which is not an uh, act of tyranny or oppression. <laughs> he's, he, he's, he's praising her. Right? But, and God answers him and says, uh, he doesn't give him an answer. Who shall I say sent me? Because Moses doesn't want to go back to Egypt because he, he left there 40 years ago. And uh, he's now in front of a burning bush, but I go back there. Uh, okay. And who are you? And who shall I say sent me? And he says, I am that I am. Or some translation, have, I will be what I will be, which is, you will see who I am by, what's, by what happens when I go with you, which is, I'll be your savior. You're gonna see who that is, if it's the latter interpretation, right? But it's a revelation of his being, but he doesn't name himself there per se, but he, he, he is identifying who he is. He's being, he is, he is the author of being, he is uncreated being, he's therefore your creator as well, who have being. I mean, there's a lot of philosophy that goes into that. Actually, I think it's central to Thomas Aquinas' philosophy, that notion of being there. But the idea of identifying yourself and self-originating activity, that begins with God in scripture and it gets downloaded to humanity post-Descartes. Now we identify ourselves, we don't 
want to call ourselves creatures. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein did call the monster a creature, which is interestingly, but it's a creature of Frankenstein, the scientist. And she sees the scientist as doing worse to human nature than what God did to Adam. That's the analogy that was made, right? He says, if you would, I, I only wish that I had a creator that loved me like Adam's creator did. You totally abandoned me. You left me to my own devices. You act, acted as if, if you had nothing to do with my creation. He says, if you love me, I will love you in return. But if you spurn me and reject me, I will be a monster. So um, just let me complete the thought and I, I will answer this. So there's a downgrading or a, a devolution of authority and of uh, the thinking process from the mind of God, which was the traditional desire of education to think God's thoughts after him, to understand the created order in terms of how the creator laid it out. And that's what education means. It's to recover the lost ruins uh, of, of the Garden of Eden. The mind of Adam is to be recovered by us. We need to see God. That's what Milton says. The, the, the task of education is to re restore the ruins of our lost foreparents by learning to know God aright and to love him and to love other people. That's what he says. Descartes flips it so that we are the center of, of all thinking. And uh, that sort of devolution goes from a vertical hierarchy in which God is the author of being and determines and reveals who he is and he's the, he, we're to think God's thoughts after him to flip it around so that it's more vertical. A and we move, um, from a cosmology, and this is from uh, the discarded image, by the way, right at the end, if you go to the epilogue, and I quote here, we go from a cosmology in which it was axiomatic that, quote, all perfect things precede all imperfect things. That is, they come first. The perfect precedes the imperfect. We go from that to one in which it is axiomatic that the starting point, or Entwicklungsgrund in German, uh, is always lower than what is developed. In other words, the past is inferior to what the present is. So we start by saying that we began in human origins in the form of the caveman, the man who couldn't speak, the man who had no reasoning ability, whatever, and as time progressed, we got better and better and better. So it went from a fall from a height to a, an ascent from a valley. And then we append to that a biological theory called evolution. But it's a tendency of thought. I just wanted to complete my thought. Do you have still have the question? Go, yeah. please then. Um, I think it ties into that. Is within the commentary Tolkien and C.S. Lewis are making is that all things like Frankenstein that are created without God at the center of it result in like tangible destruction. Um, I guess an example of that is I did some research and how I wonder if this is a part of the whole eugenics thing, but scientists are positing that they can repopulate the woolly mammoth, for example. Yeah, that's in science fiction films as well, right? Yeah, and it's being done. Like it is, yeah. Pretty wild. Although I don't know if they've been successful in that. I don't, as far as I know. Not the point of the woolly mammoth, right. but in other species, species that are extinct. That are extinct they have been. Because they have the genetic, genetic material sufficient to. Exactly. Really? Exactly. What's an example of that? Do you know? Well, don't the, don't and let me it's off it's get you off track. Okay. Type of cow okay. Was extinct that they have brought back to life. Okay. Um, but the idea behind the woolly mammoth is that they played an essential part in the ecosystem and the cooling of the earth. Right. Right. The sun is back to right. stuff like that. So even right. if it has a quote unquote positive aim, would they posit that because it's void of God, it will result like Frankenstein? No, I think it's more the general tendency. It's not that everything that is done by science in the name of is always has an evil motive. It's the general tendency, which is the domination of all of life and the attempt to control it for the betterment of all things. So you might fix one problem here, but you might have an unintended consequences of that. Maybe there's a reason why those cows died out. I don't know. Maybe there's no reason. Maybe it was actually a terrible thing that all the cows died or were killed or who knows what. Um, and and um, 
So there can be, I think, even from a Christian vantage point, there could be cases made for certain things that happen. But it, no, it's the general tendency to act and to allow science to be led by a principle that it won't identify for a good that it can't enunciate uh, and utilizing uh, practices that would be regarded as immoral by any human standard. And the way that you get rid of that problem is by getting rid of any human standard, except that of equality, which becomes the dominant principle and again part of the Enlightenment and the uh, aims of the Enlightenment in addition to uh, autonomy the uh, models of the French Revolution are liberté, égalité, fraternity, right? Freedom, equality, fraternity. Uh, they got a lot of freedom. They chopped off the king's head. <laughs> they got rid of the political state. Uh, equality, uh, I'm not sure they ever did so well on that front because they then put a new group of leaders in charge and then they executed them. And then so they had to bring in Napoleon, the strong man, to quell the chaos that ensued, and so they got a tyrant rather than a king. A bad king, confessedly, but was it better afterwards? Well, then Napoleon went marching around Europe and did it all over the place and brought in uh, what was called the, the civic law. And, uh, but again, a uh, characteristic of Napoleon's rule and uh, the civic code, they got rid of the seven-day week and tried to replace it with a 10-day week because it was a it was a rational way of doing it, organizing everything in accordance with the metric system. Let's do it with the weeks or the days of the week as well. We'll have a 10 day week and we'll see how that works. And it was abandoned pretty early because it <laughs> created chaos. Um, but in a sense, you can see an anti Christian motif there as well. We want to eradicate things that don't make sense by rational, at least mathematical principles. The number 10. Like, think about it in terms of uh, temperature. It's eminently rational and practical. Water freezes at zero, it boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Very practical. You know, what is it in, in Fahrenheit? Most people don't even know the boiling point and the, and the freezing point. Um, so it seems more sensible. Well, how about we do it here? Well, there's nothing mentioned about freezing or boiling in scripture, but there is something mentioned about the days of the week and the way life fits that uh, pattern which God has established in Genesis 1, uh, Genesis 1 and 2. Anyway, but this general shift and the, the flipping on its head so that we have a devolutionary um, viewpoint, that's the traditional way of it. Once things were perfect and they've got worse and worse and worse and worse and sin abounds and the world gets worse. Technology may progress, but that doesn't mean that humanity gets any better. Sin abounds and it, and, and, and it extends itself to some degree. And even biologically, they'll talk about the principle of entropy. Do you know this at all, the principle of entropy? Which is just simply things fall apart. So early human beings were better than us. They lived longer. Their capacities were better than ours. Uh, simply because they don't have the problem of entropy, they don't have the copying mistakes that go with, um, with bearing children. Copying mistakes come into the whole genetic process and with each successive generation, people get weaker and, and less capable. Um, the way you deal with it in the animal kingdom is through eugenics. You force this uh, bull to mate with this cow to get a better yield and stronger oxen and so forth. So you forcibly, you, you play with the process because the, otherwise they note that these genetic uh, mistakes become more and more prevalent. So one of the rationales that some people have posited for the prohibition against incest is exactly that. You get a lot of genetic abnormalities. That might just, that's just one reason. I would have thought there's a whole lot of others as well, but, but that is one of the things that people have observed is you get people who are literally having physical deformities because inbreeding. And that's the copying mistakes because you're too, too much alike and there, there's something that's missed in that. Anyway, uh, but that just illustrates the principle of entropy or devolution as the, uh, I think the scientific way of seeing the humanity. Whereas we have evolution now, as it's getting better and better, I say, where's the evidence of that? 
Where's the evidence of things getting ever better? Aside from my smartphone, which is recording, and I can put on YouTube and it can be seen all over the world. I'm not even sure that's progress. Some people watching this will certainly think this is not progress. But in terms of a, a capacity for reaching power, whatever it is. But um, does it mean I'm a better person because I have a better smartphone? Or that society is better because it has that? Because that thing is also surveilling me. It's listening in, somebody can watch, I can be monitored. Is that progress or regress? <coughs> is my human ma nature being enhanced by that or is it being enhanced at the expense of something else? Which I haven't even noticed. It's, it's war Tolkien's warning about the palantir, the seeing stones. Yeah, it's giving you great power, but do you have the virtue to use that? Do you, do you have the legitimacy of being the heir of Elendil to wield that stone and, and uh, because if you don't, it's going to fry you. Whoever's on the other side will, will dominate you, right? And we, you, you'll remember that passage uh, when uh, Pippin grabs the seeing stone and he gets grabbed by Sauron who's on the other side of it. But, but, but uh, Aragorn, when he decides it's time to put a little fright into uh, Sauron says, I will wield it, and he pulls it out, and you know, it's me. And then he's like, and here I've got the sword. Because <laughs> now it's not, this is not, this is not a hobbit here. This is one who could actually wield the ring just and deplace, uh, deplace uh, Sauron and take his own seat on the throne. Now he is never going to do that because he's too virtuous. He knows he can't wield it. It would corrupt him. But Sauron doesn't know that because his only motivation is domination and power and he assumes everybody else is. That has the same motivation. Anyway, so I think the technological progress does come with certain alluring benefits, but they are matched or probably <coughs> uh, put into the pale by the downsides. And one of them is that um, our kids are addicted to smartphones and they have a sense of themselves which is the image they see on the screen I talked about the, the, the psychological effect anxieties um, but even just addiction the smartphone addictions which everybody knows from using them psychoaddictive is that really that great I kids are on the smartphones beside one another texting one another so they're sitting beside why don't they talk to each other and, and the result of that is they feel, even when they're connected with people, which they're addicted into feeling they need to do, they feel lonely. And they don't see an embodied sense of themselves. And the idea of being a uh, different sex than the one in which they're born is a plausible option. Maybe that will solve my problem of why I don't feel happy. It acquires a plausibility at that point. But the effect of this is uh, of materialism and utilitarian assumptions, which it are there in Peter Singer and B.F. Skinner, is to suggest that humans have no more innate value than any other form of life. No more. And that, on that basis, Singer thinks that infanticide is permissible. I don't mean to demonize Singer. I'm just saying he's an exponent and a, and a, uh, a very uh, rhetorically powerful exponent of a certain position that is a tendency in Western thought. That's what I'm saying. It's part of the scientific mindset. And it's motivated by this sense of, uh, which we get from evolutionary psychology. Need I say it? By the way, Jordan Peterson is an evolutionary psychologist. <clears throat> so I, I have serious doubts about the ethical legitimacy of a position that begins with evolutionary psychology. How can you hold on to morality even if you think it's good? Is Where's the basis for that? Um, but he thinks that, as I say, human beings have no more rights than any other animal singer. And I would think, uh, uh, what's his name, B.F. Skinner would hold the same thing. Um, than, uh, than any other being. 
and it all depends on their capacity for self-awareness and for agency. So if you're handicapped, Singer thinks you ought to be allowed, or your parents ought to be allowed to kill you. Uh, this was the same rationale the Nazis used, by the way, as well. An unworthy life, is the phrase they used. Uh, Lewis and Tolkien, uh, but here I'm particularly talking about Lewis, is going to suggest that a moral, rational nature is intrinsic to all uh, life that bears the Imago Dei. But even further than that, he's going to sit, talk about a rational nature that is even in creatures that don't bear the Imago Dei, because only human beings bear the Imago Dei. The creatures on planet, uh, what's it called? In Out of the Silent Planet, what's the name of that? Malacandra, Mars. <coughs> uh, they do not bear the Imago Dei, but they are rational, sentient beings. They recognize the natural law. They have an archon, they have a, uh, something like a, a ruler over them, something like an angel, who rules them with justice and equity. And they don't break that. There's a certain moral law and they, they live in accordance with it. They are not fallen beings. There's no fall on planet Malacandra. The fallen beings are the human beings that come there and are willing to basically kill everything for the sake of gold, for power, for progress, pretty much. Speaking from the same uh, mindset as, I think, uh, Skinner and particularly Singer. A other comments or questions here? Because now I want to get on to it, the lecture, which I, or the essay I didn't talk about, uh, The Funeral of a Great Myth. I didn't give this to you. Have you read the, yes? Question. Oh, no, sorry, just going back to what you mentioned. Please. So the Romantic movement is marked by an exaltation of nature all over the place. It sees nature as good and society as evil, following Rousseau, same, I talked about that dynamic. Where does evil come from? It comes from society. How do we get rid of the evil of society? By, by going back to nature and in particular our nature. Well, what is our nature? It's connected to our feelings. Our feelings are the expression of our inmost self, not our reasoning, but our feelings. Now there is a sort of a rational and a logic to the feelings and the logic is this, we are connected to the world around us. We're part of it, it's part of us. The, the Wordsworth's notion of human nature is it's in the air, it's in the water, it's all around us. It's literally his sense of self. There's no distinction. In other words, uh, we would call it pantheism or panentheism. Lewis mentions it in book to chapter one of mere Christianity as a view that is uh, <coughs> held by Hegel and the Romantics. He doesn't mention the Romantics. He likes the Romantics for some reason. He gives them a free pass. Found in Hegel and in Hinduism that God is everywhere and in everything. If that's so, everything's sacred. If everything's sacred, nothing's sacred is what I would suggest is the implication of it. There's no, there's no good and evil. Good and evil are ways of seeing the same thing from a different vantage point. What one person calls good, another person will call evil, but it's just a subjective impression. Depends on what you regard as uh, most important, but there is no absolute there. There's no right and wrong, uh, good or evil or whatever. <laughs> that comes with the romantic movement, and um, it, it's not an accident that the modern nation state begins in the romantic period. Modern France, modern Britain, it's not that they didn't exist as entities before that, but understood as a people and a nation with a language 
and an identity connected to that, and it's connected to a, a distinct identity as opposed to human identity. It's also not uh, accidental that uh, the colonization of Africa begins by nations animated by the same sense. It's called the scramble for Africa. It's in the 1870s. Uh, so colonization had happened before that, here in Canada, South America, and so forth. In Africa, it happens in 1870. There are colonies there before, but the, all of the European powers go all at once down to possess territory in the name of whatever country they came from. And to exercise, because it, it exhibits uh, the goodness and virtue of their nation, that they're growing, they're expanding, they're evolving. And they're exercising dominion over the earth and probably over peoples who are benighted and are going to benefit from their civilization. <coughs> uh, whether they did benefit from it, I think, is, uh, I think there's a discussion to be had there. I don't think it's unambiguously bad. I also don't think it's unambiguously good either. Uh, it's called the white man's burden. Yeah, read it. Have you heard it, Kipling? Read it. It's a poem. The white man's burden. You'll never, you don't get it in universities. I've, I've sometimes taught it in first year. The white man's burden. Bring on the white man's burden. You're going to be cursed by all these benighted tribes and so forth, but you're going to do it anyway because it's better for everyone. You're, you're, you're bringing a sense of civilization, humanity. It's not done in the name of Christ. There's no Christian motivation. You're bringing enlightenment. I, I think that it's motivated more by the Romantic movement than it is by Christianity. It comes after the Christian missionary movement. Important point. The Baptist missionary movement goes to India in uh, the early 19th century with the motive of spreading the gospel and seeing uh, the Indians as, as brothers who need to hear the gospel and are, have the same rights and privileges as uh, the Europeans. We're, we're doing it out of self-sacrifice. We're going for that motivation. That's a different thing than going to colonize a country in the name of king and country and make sure that they speak good English or good French or whatever and making sure part of the greater France or Germany or England or Belgium or whatever. Read Heart of Darkness. It's about colonization. It's about what Belgium did in the Congo. It's now being associated with Christianity. I think it's a slur. Same with the residential schools. Abuses, most of that is absolute garbage and nonsense. I say that as a native. All the graves they're finding, there is no, there is no bodies yet been found. Not one uninterred. They're evidence of possible, <laughs> possible bodies. Well, they still haven't found one a year on from when they said they were last year. They're mass graves. It's, it's a genocide. Where's the evidence of it? Where's the evidence? I mean, produce the evidence. You're making a charge of eugenic or, or, or genocide. This is a very serious charge and it needs to be taken seriously. If you're gonna make a serious charge, you better be able to support it because this is a, this is a uh, doctrine that justifies war, to my mind, right? Genocide allows a nation to say we have to stop this with all possible means. Who, who did this and why? I think it's not the product of Christianity. Christians cooperated with it and largely, to my mind, have a mixed legacy but mostly good. The intention was good. The residential schools, to some degree, did good things. They were desired by native tribes. <coughs> But there's a mixed legacy, as I say. One of my great-grandparents, uh, she had all of her children sent to the Mohawk Institute in Brantford, and they all ran away. They all died. All of them. Not sure why. And uh, she ended up taking her own life, or just dying. I think she died, died of heartbreak. So it's mixed. I, but I don't think it's as... But the... But the bringing it in as a national policy of forcible, you will send your children, that's, that's a national government. That's, that's, that's the totalitarian colonialist mindset. I don't think that's the Christian mindset at all. Anyway, it's a mixed bag, I admit that, but I don't think that is unambiguously, genocide is a very strong word. 
the Canadian Parliament just uh, passed a motion unopposed, not one single opposition to the idea of calling it a genocide, which I find extraordinary. Extraordinary. Off topic. On topic, off topic. Um, because again, the, the rationale that goes along with that is it justifies the state to intervene to prevent further injustices from happening and the malefactors to be found out and punished and there to be some form of retribution equality to come out of that. Again, listening to uh, the tribes of this country, uh, they don't seem to be very optimistic about the government's ability to improve their lot in life, they can't even give them drinking water, still. Anyway, uh, funeral of a great myth. This is one I wish I had assigned to you and I didn't and I, I want to say something about it. What have I done with my notes here? Uh, not there, is it there? No. Did I even bring them? I think I did. Uh, oh, I put it up on the, yes. Excuse me here. Here it is. Funeral of a Great Myth or the debate on atheism as religion. It's just called the Funeral of a Great Myth, actually. I don't know where the thing in brackets came from. I think it's just because it's somebody put it up on the internet. Uh, but it begins with what you read there. There are some mistakes which humanity has made and repeated so often that there is now really no excuse for making them again. One of these is the injustice which every age does its predecessor. For instance, the ignorant contempt with which the humanists, even good humanists like Sir Thomas More, 16th century uh, Catholic saint, had for medieval philosophy, or romantics, even good romantics like Keats, felt for 18th century poetry. Each time all this, quote, reaction and resentment has to be punished and unsaid. It is a wasteful performance. It is tempting to see whether we, at least, cannot avoid it. Why should we not give our predecessors a fair and filial dismissal? Well, if you take everything I've said thus far, the whole premise of modernity is exactly that. It's a repudiation not only of the past, but the whole trajectory of looking at the past, that things were great and good and were there to recover them. Uh, mod modernity is built on the premise that there's the only good is the good that we invent. And the d definition of goodness is uh, just watch me. You'll see what the vision of the future is. Uh, you'll own nothing and be happy with it, that sort of thing. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't forgive myself, couldn't uh, resist there. But such at all events is the attempt I'm going to make in this paper. I come to bury the great myth of the 19th and earliest 20th century, but also to praise it. I'm going to pronounce a funeral oration. By this great myth, I mean that picture of reality which resulted in the period under consideration not logically, but imaginatively. Now, this is, the, this is a key point, imaginatively. For some of the most striking and, so to speak, marketable theories of real scientists, I have heard this myth called Wellsianity. Oop, right, we just read. The name is a good one, insofar as it does justice to the share which a great imaginative writer bore in building it up. But it is not satisfactory. It suggests, as we shall see, an error about the date in which the myth became dominant. And it also suggests that the myth affected only the middle brow mind. In fact, it is as much behind Bridges' testimony, Testament of Beauty as it is behind the work of Wells. It dominates minds as different as those of Professor Alexander and Walt Disney. It is implicit in nearly every modern article on politics, politics, sociology, and ethics. I call it a myth because, as I have said, the imaginative and not the logical result pardon me, uh, not the logical result of what is vaguely called modern science. It's not the logical result. It's the imaginative, the wished result. It's the projected result. It's a utopian future that is cast, which we want to see. Strictly speaking, there is, I confess, no such thing as modern science. There are only particular sciences, all in a state of rapid change and sometimes inconsistent with one another. What the myth uses is a selection from the scientific theories, a selection made at first 
and modified afterwards in obedience to imaginative and emotional needs. It is the work of the folk imagination. Moved by a natural appetite for an impressive unity, it therefore treats its data with great freedom, selecting, slurring, expurgating, and adding at will. So in other words, it has a, um, a bias of, uh, what do we call this? What's the name of the bias here? can't remember the name of the bias. Sorry, confirmation bias. It, it confirms the imaginative view that we see of the future and everything that confirms it, we say, see, there's the evidence. And the things that doesn't, it doesn't fit, well, we just ignore that. So it's selective in its uh, view of what constitutes verification. The central idea of the myth is what its believers would call evolution or development or emergence, just as the central idea in the myth of Adonis is death and rebirth. I do not mean that the doctrine of evolution as held by practicing biologists is a myth. It may be shown by later biologists to be a less satisfactory hypothesis than was hoped 50 years ago. 50 years ago, um, when Darwin was still probably alive. Or not long after, at any rate, he was dead. But that does not amount to being a myth. It is a genuine scientific hypothesis, but we must sharply distinguish between evolution as a biological theorem and popular evolutionism or developmentalism, which is certainly a myth. And I talked about that already. The myth of progress and the myth of the progress of humanity and human nature. Before proceeding to describe it and which is my chief business to pronounce its eulogy, I had better make clear its mythical character. First of all, chronology. If popular evolution were, as it imagined itself to be not a myth, but the intellectually legitimate result of the scientific theorem on the public mind, it would arise after that theorem had become widely known. So you would expect Darwinism to be the scientific hypothesis, and then after verification had happened, then a myth would arise out of it explaining why it was good and so forth. But that's not what he sees. And I don't see it either, again, as an 18th century and early 19th century specialist. It's not there. There's already uh, things that I would describe as evolutionary in their uh, imagination long before Darwin. So the myth exists before the scientific theorem, which makes me question whether the scientific theorem is really based on science or rather on a conception, uh, an imaginative conception of how things might be if humanity took control of itself autonomously. To go back to the beginning of the lecture, if the autonomy posited to the individual were foisted on the collective humanity and controlled from the top down, what would that look like if we contro controlled our own human nature? We have known the theorem first uh, when we should have known the theorem first to a few, then adopted by all the scientists, then spreading to all men of general education. Then beginning uh, to affect poetry and the arts, and so finally percolating the mass of the people. In fact, however, we had something quite different. The clearest and finest poetic expression of the myth came before the origin of species was published in 1859 and long before it had established itself as scientific orthodoxy. And where do we find it? We find it in Keats. He quotes Keats here and he, uh, he keeps it from Keats' Hyperion. Here's the quote. As heaven and earth are fairer, fairer far than chaos and blank darkness, though once chief, and as we show Beyond that heaven and earth in form and shape, compact and beautiful, in will, in action free, companionship and thousand other signs of purer life, so on our heels a fresh perfection treads, a power more strong in beauty, born of us and fated to excel us as we pass in glory that old darkness. So there's a, a, an organic motif here. So we become a, a better uh, form of uh, an, an, evil, an evolved consciousness that gives way to a yet more evolved form of consciousness which makes our form of consciousness, consciousness obsolete and our human nature 
unworthy of consideration. It makes history irrelevant. It makes revealed a relig religion a nonsense. Keats expresses this in his Hyperion poem, and this is 40 years before Origin of Species. On the continent, we have the Ring of the Nibelungs. The tragedy of the evolutionary myth has never been more notably expressed than in Wagner's Wotan. Uh, I'll just skip over this. But then he goes, and goes on to talk about uh, Shaw and so forth. Uh, he will mention, uh, so he's mentioned thus far, H.G. Wells, Charles Darwin, George Bernard Shaw, John Keats, Richard Wagner, and he will also mention Olaf Stapledon. Um, he, he has in mind that he's, he's mentioning uh, six different writers, different eras, but all of them expressing a certain worldview that predates uh, Darwin per se, other than mentioning Darwin himself. But um, three of them um, are advocating a form of non-religious humanism. H.G. Uh, Wells, which we've seen from his fiction, there's no God, there's no sense of any significance to God, that's characteristic of science fiction. Uh, Olaf Stapledon and uh, George Bernard Shaw, and they have a progressive view of morality as well. Morality is something that the present determines for itself. It needn't be guided by the past. We determine what's good and, and true and right. And uh, in Keats and Wagner, uh, we have a collective concern for, uh, not for morality per se, but just the, the beauty of the death of the present and its replacement by something far greater. It's the, so uh, Wagner is based on Norse mythology, so the myth of Ragnarok, the destruction of all things, which most of you know from that Thor movie, <laughs> which is quite hilarious, I have to say. It's a, um, but that, it's a myth and it's a negative myth. It's a myth of destruction, of entropy. But, but Darwin is the only one associated with evolution per se, because he's the scientist. But all of them express the same evolutionary perspective as, as Keats did there. You could see this supersedes that, and it's better than this before it. This is, again, 40 years. Where does he get this idea from? It's the emancipation of the present material towards something that's more spiritual. So it becomes more and more spiritual, less and more, less material, and certainly uh, better and brighter and more beautiful, very optimistic. So he calls this popular evolutionism. So he's not, he's very careful. He's not talking about evolution per se, although he could by different grounds, but here he's not interested in, in engaging with that. But he wants to talk about popular evolutionism, uh, talking a worldview that will include all of this philosophy of change and progress. Now, this is going to become important when we come to uh, Paralandra, because in the first installment, Weston, the scientist, is animated by the, the desire to uh, obliterate life, basically. He doesn't care about, uh, he just wants progress. Doesn't matter. He, he's sort of in the, uh, like a Frankenstein type of scientist. I'm going to do this and it doesn't matter if I have to annihilate worlds as long as humanity expands and extends its uh, footprint on, on the cosmos. Uh, he'll move from that to a, a spirituality in the second one. So that's the first part. The second is that it's different from the biological theory of evolution. So popular evolution is different than the biological theory. A uh, biologist at least recognizes that evolution is a hypothesis. Whereas these people believe in it as a religion. And so there's something unscientific about this belief in evolutionism and the myth of progress. So he's going to defend those who are actually biologists who hold to evolution as a hypothesis and recognize the, that the methodology of science is that hypotheses can be replaced by better explanations. Okay, so we'll just leave that with that. But then there's a, a third one, um, which is that it, um, it has a fatal contradiction 
in addition to depending on a lawful and orderly universe, which it doesn't really believe to exist, and relying upon rational thought, which it doesn't really believe to hold, because otherwise we couldn't say that reason came from non-reason, right? So, or that we could come from the animal, because the animals don't have reason, we do. How can reason come from a non-rational entity? How is this possible? Something that was not in the original thing springs out of it. Where did it come from? This is an impossibility. Animals don't have the capacity for rational thought, and neither do trees, and neither do amoeba. Right? There's no capacity. So ra rational being is something that is categorically distinct. So they assume the capacity of rationality, while at the same time their, their whole theory of evolution contradicts it. And this is the fatal uh, feature of it. Uh, anyway, that's what he talks about. I realize I'm running out of time here. But in The Funeral of a Great Myth, he goes on to talk then about how he finds it glorious because the end of the great myth, and this uh, directs to your question, where is it going? He sees the ultimate outcome of this in Wagner's the destruction of all things. It's a, it's a raging against the dying of the light, which is actually an embrace of chaos and a desire to destroy. And he says that the idea that humanity is, is dying a noble death for a grand sacrifice, for a grand cause, he thinks is the greatest myth he's ever heard. It's just, the problem is it's just a myth. It's not true. So he's not going to accept it as, as science, per se, and he thinks it can be rationally critiqued, etc. Anyway, you will find this discussion in the sci-fi trilogy. We'll deal with Out of the Silent Planet next time, I believe, and, and see how it plays out there. Okay? See you then.